it's just so wonderful. We have so many individuals around the country and the world. So, well, I want to uh, do my best and honor your time. I want to thank everybody um, from coming today. And uh, we have a wonderful uh, guest here today. It was not really a guest because he's a he's our faculty member, but we have uh, Dr. Justin Young here today. And he's our adjunct professor, Old Testament here in Jacksonville, Florida, but he also serves as the director of our academic and information systems. And I'll allow him to expound on that. Uh, things that you'll kind of learn uh, about uh, Dr. Young is that he has, his main area is in Pentateuchal studies. Hopefully I'm saying that right. Dr. Young, you can always correct that's me. That's great. Yeah, that's um, perfect. But basically he knows a lot about the book of Exodus and Mount Sinai. Um, so uh, <laughs> if you have questions, anything concerning Mount Sinai and the book of Exodus, Dr. Young is going to be able to assist you. I will be your moderator, your host today. My name is Jonathan Crum, and I work in admissions. So if any of you have ever submitted an inquiry, Hello. you've probably talked uh, with me, I've probably talked with you, or you've probably emailed one of my colleagues. Um, just to uh, put things in order, um, if you do have questions for Dr. Young, go ahead and put them in the chat. And then what we can do is we can answer them when we get to the time of Q&A, all right? So without further any further ado, everybody, Dr. Justin Young. Hello. Did. Sorry. Uh, thank you so much for, for being here. I, I'm really excited to be able to do this. Um, I... I wanted to start off by uh, just sharing a little bit from the Word of God, from uh, Psalm chapter one, and uh, let me let me do that real quickly. Psalm chapter one. It begins the whole book of Psalms begins this way: "Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits." in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Yes. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and on its, and its leaves. Dr. Young, you muted yourself. Oh, sorry about that. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I don't think I touched that. So Jonathan, is this, is this um, muting me? Uh, no, I got you. Like got timing you. out or something? Okay. No, you're okay. Uh, I'll, I'll pick it up uh, in, in verse three. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but they are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. And this is the word of the Lord. And uh, this is a, uh, a something that I have, I wanted to share this tonight because I actually just got done sharing this a few weeks ago with my Hebrew one class. And um, I've kind of made a tradition of, of doing something like this uh, when I teach through uh, Hebrew. And I'm going on my, this is my third time teaching biblical, uh, through the biblical Hebrew track um, at Gordon-Conwell. And what I like to do is typically I like to take a passage and put it up on the screen at the beginning uh, of the semester, usually when students are starting Hebrew one and all they can really see is is lines <laughs> you know uh, looks something like you know like the matrix uh when they're looking at it in in biblical hebrew and then uh you know throughout the class we're always doing eventually we'll get to the point where we're doing translation and you know working through the hebrew text and by the time they get to the end of hebrew 2 i usually try to do something that's in my <laughs> what I consider to be a very Hebraic idea. It's kind of forms a, what we would call an inclusio. 
where I put that same text up at, at the end of Hebrew 2. And frankly, uh, even if the students don't notice it right away, I, stin I tend to get a little emotional <laughs> just because I, I think back, I'm getting emotional talking about it right now. Um, I think back to, you know, when the students that came into the class, they, they couldn't make sense of any of it. And then now they can, they can read the text. And this is something, this is a Psalm that I like to begin my classes in biblical Hebrew with because um, it, the Psalms actually begin with this call to meditate on God's word day and night. And that's the call to, to meditate on God's word day and night. And so uh, in verse two, you see here that his delight is not in, uh, you know, those who, you know, walk in the counsel wow. of the wicked, nor stand uh, in the way of sinners. And then you go on to verse two, but his delight is in the law or instruction of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. And this word meditate in biblical Hebrew, the way it's translated is it's rightly translated as meditate here, but uh, the term in biblical Hebrew, Hagah, is actually a word that's used in a variety of different places, uh, especially in the book of Isaiah. And it's actually what we would call uh, an automata poetic word, a word that is formed on the basis of uh, what it sounds like. And so this word is actually a word that conveys the idea of speaking something and muttering something. It's used of, you know, kind of birds chirping and people moaning and, you know, all kinds of audible sounds. And so you can picture this idea that the call here is, you know, you can picture, just picture someone meditating, muttering, pouring over the word of God. And, and that's, that's what the call is here in Psalm 1. And they're to do this. When, when are they to do this? Well, it says here day and night. And, you know, is this simply, does this simply just mean, you know, well, do it when you wake up in the morning and before you go, go to bed? Well, yeah, that, that, that could be, but actually um, this is probably a figure of speech that we, uh, that's known as a mirism that is used quite often in, in biblical Hebrew, um, where, where you say the beginning of something and you say the end of something and it applies everything else in between. It's this idea of a constant pouring over of the word of God. And uh, in the call here is this in verse three, it, you know, this is the image that we're given uh, that, you know, for those who meditate on God's instruction that commit themselves to this process of meditating on God's instruction. This is the picture. Verse three, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Okay, now notice here the prosperity that's mentioned here uh, the, in the context of what, pros, what, what does prospering mean here? It, it, it's clearly this idea of a tree that's yielding its fruit in its season. In, 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 in Hebrew, it just, it, it's in its time. The fruit comes. And I always like to remind students about this because, you know, frankly, uh, you know, it's, especially in the States, we live in a, in a culture uh, that is, is very demanding, uh, a very rushed and hurried culture. Um, I noticed this even just recently, we moved back uh, in 2018 from, from Belfast. Uh, I, we lived in Belfast from 2014 to 2018 uh, when I was doing my, my PhD. And even just moving from Belfast back to the States, I noticed this sense of just hurrying and, you know, all of these types of things. And, and, um, and it, it's interesting because we, we want fruit in all seasons. We want the fruit in, in all times, right? Um, but that's actually not the promise here. The promise here is that the fruit will come in its time. 
And, and this is my promise to my students when they begin uh, a, a biblical Hebrew class, because often many come into the class, they're quite intimidated, as I was when I first you know, started biblical Hebrew. Um, and and, I, and I, I always want students to know that if you commit yourself to the word of God, if you commit yourself, whether it's, you know, learning biblical Hebrew and, and, uh, and the getting in the weeds of all of that, um, or more generally, just committing yourself to the word of God. The promise here is that the fruit will come. And the fruit may not come in your time, in the timing that you think, but we're to commit ourselves to the process of meditating on God's word. And, and that's the promise that the fruit will come in its time and that we will be like a tree that's planted by streams of water that yields its fruit, not in every single season, but in its season, in its time when it's supposed to, it yields its fruit in a way that is healthy for the tree, in a, in a way that expresses the health of the tree, right? And so um, anyway, it's a great joy that I have to see students actually do this, whether it be uh, in biblical Hebrew or in other classes, that they, they commit themselves to the word of God and Yes, there's times where they're just slogging through, especially in Hebrew. There's there's some there's some weeks that you know you just gotta slog through and keep going. Um, but it's a great joy to see when students uh, really start to see that fruit coming, and uh, I'm just really thrilled that I get to be a part of that process. It's a great joy for me. Um, it's a it's a thrill to teach at a place like Gordon Conwell that holds the word of God uh, in high regard, and, uh, and which, is, which is an understatement. We, uh, we have a very high view of scripture, and, um, and we want scripture to permeate every aspect of what we're doing at Gordon-Conwell. So um, anyway, I just wanted to begin with, with Psalm 1. Um, I, it's something that um, I, um, I, I often share with students and try to begin uh, each semester with this, with this call uh, to commit ourselves to, to this process. And so um, anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there for now. Uh, I'm Again, I'm Dr. Uh, Justin Young, and um, I teach in Old Testament, I teach biblical Hebrew, and I teach um, some other uh, exegesis courses at Gordon-Conwell. And I also teach some uh, uh, Bible interpretation. Uh, I'm teaching a course on uh, Bible interpretation. Um, it, it's like a general level hermeneutics course that uh, doesn't require the languages. So anyway, I want to thank you all for, for coming out tonight. And um, yeah, I'll, I'll turn it back over to, to Jonathan. Yeah, we've got some, some questions. We'll start pouring in here uh, shortly. Just, just know, guys, that um, you have questions, go ahead and put them in, in the chat. Um, one of the things that I wanted to, to bring uh, to light because um, there are so many people who um, don't understand the importance of learning uh, an original language um, because you, know, you can go out and get a Strong's Concordance and you can go out on uh, any one of these websites and you can look at the original text and they'll link everything together. And so someone could be tempted to say, well, why would I need to take a, a Hebrew class? I have all the materials I need to be able to do that. Um, what would you say to that individual, Dr. Young? Yeah, well, you know, it's, it reminds me a lot of myself when I was when I was going into my undergraduate degree. I, I ended up actually majoring in biblical languages uh, when I was uh, an undergraduate at, at Moody Bible Institute in, in Chicago. And uh, but I didn't start out that way. I went into Moody um, actually as a as a youth ministry major. Um, I was I was really uh, really excited about the idea of doing youth ministry, and it and it was. I really went into my undergraduate education with 
uh, just really a lot of misconceptions about biblical scholarship, about, uh, about theological education. And it was, uh, unfortunately, I kind of had this idea of, you know, hey, let me just get, a, get my education and, and get out of here so that I can get on to doing ministry. I don't want, want to get caught up in all the, all the bookworm, you know, stuff, right? And it really was during that, that time that the Lord really just began to work in, in my life. And it came through the classes I was taking. And, um, and there just came a point when uh, I remember after taking a class, I think it was a class on the book of Genesis, and uh, just seeing the way that the, the professor interacted with, with the language and seeing how valuable that was to the whole process, um, it really led me into wanting to study biblical Hebrew. And um, in, in, in that program, you actually have to, you know, if you're a biblical language major, you actually have to pick one and go with it. So, so you know, I, I took a lot of Hebrew in my undergraduate days, but I actually still remember, I, I'm trying to, I'll try not to get choked up when I say this, because I, I, I do, I got emotional the other day telling this to someone, I forget, I forget who it was. But I actually still remember uh, walking to the registrar's office to change my major. And, and I, I remember doing it just out of sheer faith, because at the time I was thinking, I don't even know if I can really do this. You know, this is, this is going to be difficult. And I'm, probably significantly, you know, increasing the amount of work I'm going to have to do to complete my, my degree. Things are going to be a lot harder for me. And I don't just, I just don't know if I can do this. And, and it was really out of just faith that I, that I changed my major to, to biblical languages. And it was in that process that I actually, I remember talking this over with my pastor at the time. I was saying, you know, I had a lot of those same questions of, you know, is it really worth it? I mean, you know, you, you commit yourself to learning this language, but, you know, can't you just, uh, you know, you know, but don't we have Bible software now that, you know, has all of this stuff, you know, just worked out for us. And it, it, to, it, it's really hard to explain to someone that doesn't get to see behind the curtain when, you, when you're able to read the scriptures in biblical Hebrew or in biblical Greek, um, it, it can be really, really difficult to show, to say what you're missing out on, right? Like, so for imagine, you know, imagine that you are talking to someone that is, that, that is basically, they've only ever seen a, a television that is kind of an old analog television, right? Uh, maybe it's even in black and white. That's the only television that they've ever seen. And you're trying to explain to them what HD 4K television looks like, right? How would you go about doing that? It, it's incredibly difficult to, to do. And yet you, you want to, you know, you would want to affirm that, hey, look, we're watching the same program here, right? It's not as if you know, you, you can't know who God is, right, w without knowing the languages. Um, but though I, I like this analogy of, of a kind of a going from analog to 4K TV because it, you get to see so much clearer and, you know, you get to see the beauty of the word of God. You get to see so many of the, you know, facets of the language that don't come through in modern translations as good as they are. Um, it can be very difficult to capture. And so, um, so anyway, I, I, I like this idea of saying, you know, it's like looking at a 4K television because you're not denying that, you know, you're not saying we're looking at a completely different program. We're, we're looking at the same thing. But if you've ever seen a, a football game on a, four, a 4K television versus an old analog television, um, it's just, it's just night and day. And, and the other thing too, is I, I think, you know, people often tend to think about, you know, taking the languages. Um, they, they think that this is, an, they often think in terms of practicality. They, they say, well, is this, is this practical, right? Is this, you know, is this going to be worth it to, to spend, um, you know, a year taking Hebrew grammar one and two or Greek grammar 
one and two. And, um, and I have to tell you, it's incredibly practical. Um, when you, when you, whether you're teaching a Bible study, whether you're preparing for a sermon, uh, or whether you're just discipling your kids or, or, you know, whatever the case may be, being able to open the scriptures in, you know, Hebrew or Greek allows for you to see with confidence and not just simply rely on, you know, commentators to tell you things that you have, no, you know, no idea what they're talking about. You're not clued into those conversations, but suddenly it opens this whole new world up to you. Um, and you're able to understand what the commentaries are saying. You're able to um, glean so much more from those conversations. And um, and anyway, I could go on and on about the benefits of this, um, but it, you know, suffice it to say, Gordon Conwell, we 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 think very highly of of learning the languages. And I would just say, if you're on the fence about about it, um, you know. I, I'd be happy to to talk with anyone that's kind of you know mulling this over, um, but I think I'm a little biased, so <laughs> uh, I'll just I'll leave it there. Well, Greg, I mean that that's probably a, a pretty comprehensive. I think we'll all walk away with the whole HD and analog TV because most of us, <laughs> as I'm looking around, know what it was with the tube TV and now the high definition TVs. Nobody wants to go back. I don't know anybody that wants <laughs> to go back. I don't think anybody goes through the original language and say, nah, let me just go back to my regular translation Bible. That's good enough for me, right? Yeah. Unless their eyes have been opened and they've had the experience, um, yeah. you know, it is something that they do treasure and it does become yeah. pretty practical. So, and, and one other thing I'll share about that, Jonathan, particularly with regard to Bible software, um, I think the world of, of, of Bible software, I, I've used Accordance for uh, over a decade now. I love Accordance. Um, I could go on and on about, about how useful of a tool it is. Um, but I would say, you know, I could share, and I won't, uh, but I, I could share all kinds of stories of people that really just get off the rails very quickly because they're trying to use these tools with regard to the languages, and they don't have the training to be able to utilize those tools very well. So uh, <laughs> I could, there's a few kind of uh, really wacky stories I could tell you about about how this how this has kind of worked its way into sermons and Bible studies and things like that, but I'll spare you that. But uh, I would say, um, again, all of those things, you know, people will pay uh, a lot of money sometimes for these programs. And, you know, to, to which I would say, hey, why not take, take a year, take two semesters to lay a foundation uh, to be able to use those things to the, to the, you know, the best of your ability and to be able to use them with confidence uh, and to be able to um, uh, get, yeah, just get, get the most out of those, out of those resources and to do so in a way that is, um, that's worthy of, of the scriptures and, and their authority. Awesome. So I'm gonna ask you this because anybody who knows you is gonna ask you a question about mountains. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you, we know that we know that you have more knowledge about Sinai than the than the average, than the average Joe, right? And so what I'd like for you to do the best way that you can is give us just a tidbit of the significance of, mm. of why that is something that has really drawn you spiritually and professionally, academically. Toward, what was it that drew you towards that? That's a, that's a great question. Um, so yeah, so Jonathan, um, yeah, th there's, a, there's a running joke around here about, about me liking, liking mountains because of my, uh, in my exegesis of Exodus class, I get really giddy when I start talking about <laughs> some of this stuff. And P 
people say, wow, he, he really is, he really is passionate about, about what he's saying here. Um, so when I went into my, when I went into my, my PhD program at uh, uh, Union Theological College at the Queens University of Belfast, um, I, I actually was not going to write on, my dissertation was not going to be on the book of Exodus. It was actually going to be on uh, the, I was going to write something on the flood of Noah. And I actually got into uh, the program uh, on, you know, you have to submit a, a proposal for what you're going to be writing, writing your dissertation on. And I actually got into the program uh, with that topic. Uh, but when I got to uh, got into my program and I started meeting with my supervisor in the first few weeks, uh, you know, he was really talking to me about this, this other topic that was over here in the book of Exodus. And it was, it was in Exodus 19 through 40, the second half of the book of Exodus. And he was saying, look, you know, I'm, I'm not saying you need to switch your topic, but I am saying that I think that this other topic over here in Exodus um, would probably uh, fit a little better with a dissertation. And so um, for me, it was, it was quite simple. You know, I, I was here, I was studying with, with, um, with someone that had been writing a commentary, a, a critical commentary on the book of Exodus for, for like 15 years. Uh, you know, he had been working on uh, his uh, Apollos commentary. Um, and at the time it had not, not yet come out, but uh, it, it is out. It's been out since like 2017 now. And, and, and I was just, it was, uh, it was, I was kind of disappointed because I was really excited about writing on the flood of Noah. But it, for me, it was as simple as um, just saying, you know, look, Justin, are you going to be, you know, um, so prideful that you're going to turn away the advice of someone that's been working on this commentary for 15 years and that's supervising you? And I just, I, I said, you know, no, I, I want to submit to, to this, to this advice. And um, to this day, it is one of the, one of the most rewarding decisions I've, I've ever made. And so I'm really thrilled that, that I did it. Um, a little bit about what I did my dissertation on was, um, you know, normally Exodus 19 to 40 is a lot of chapters to write a dissertation on. You don't normally see a, a PhD dissertation on that many chapters. Um, but my dissertation was on uh, really a kind of a particular issue in, uh, in those chapters. And it dealt with really what um, the better part of 200 years of scholarship has really done with those chapters in, in academia, not necessarily in uh, evangelical scholarship, but, uh, but within academia, um, there is, there's been this kind of, um, you know, there's been this form of analysis that's gone on for quite some time that basically says, you know, assumes that Moses didn't write any of this stuff and that it comes from different sources and different, different time periods in ancient Israel. And so really what, what has kind of happened over, uh, again, the better part of 200 years of Old Testament scholarship is there's been this kind of consensus that formed that has basically suggested that the, um, you know, you have two different types of material in Exodus 19 through 40. You have 19 through 24, which is, um, you know, largely what we would call uh, Mount Sinai material, Moses going up and down Mount Sinai. You have uh, the Decalogue, you have the Book of the Covenant in there, um, and you have the sealing of the covenant in 24. And then, um, and then you have two big blocks of what we would call tabernacle material. In 25 to 31, uh, you have the, what, what we call the descriptive, uh, I'm sorry, the prescriptive tabernacle material where the Lord is prescribing how it's to be built. And then in 35 through 40, it's, it's very, similar in nature, but only now they're just building it. They're enacting all of the things that were prescribed. And really uh, what, what has happened over time is there have been scholars that have suggested that the tabernacle material is a late post-exilic invention uh, of one particular source that's known as the priestly source, whereas the Mount Sinai material 
is largely from uh, you know, other sources from the pre-exilic uh, period. And so what my dissertation does is it actually challenges this idea and it and argues that there's, that there's unity here across this material and that the material is actually better analyzed as a unity. Um, and so uh, this looks, so basically I, there's a lot that goes on here, but, um, but the, the idea is that uh, the, the temple and mountain idea uh, goes very well together when you look at other places in the ancient Near East and you look at this culture surrounding, uh, surrounding ancient Israel uh, during the times of, you know, of scripture. And uh, temples and mountains were often, you know, two different sides of the same coin. If you look at places like Mesopotamia, um, you know, temples were actually often named after mountains. Uh, and, you know, gods were considered to dwell on mountains. And so when, when, when um, people would build temples uh, for deities, they would do so in a way that reflected where they lived. And so because gods frequently dwelled on mountains, uh, temples often were constructed in a way uh, to reflect this. And so uh, obviously the Bible is, is different. It's not, you know, we, we don't want to look at all these parallels and say they're exactly the same. But when we come to the scriptures, uh, we find that God actually doesn't actually live on Mount Sinai. It's not as if when they come to Mount Sinai, he's just hanging out up there and has been waiting for them to get there. Um, rather, you know, we see in Exodus 19, God descends onto the mountain and you have this incredible theophany that takes place uh, for quite some time. And it's there that you also get the plans for this portable sanctuary that God is going to dwell in the midst of the people and journey with them to the promised land. And so um, my dissertation uh, basically tries to suggest that this, this material when kept together as a unity is much more at home uh, with other material that we would find uh, say in other places in the ancient Near East. And it also looks at the criteria that's used to, to break this material up and, um, you know, kind of say, you know, it's written by all these different sources and it reflects different ideologies. And so it, it takes a good hard look at the criteria that's used uh, for making those types of determinations and challenges that as well. So um, anyway, I've talked, I've talked long enough about this, but uh, yeah. That, that's what I was up to for, for four years in Belfast. So, and still up to for, you know, to a large degree. Yeah. They actually do try to, in, in, in many cases, try to link these to ancient Hebrew roots and build the new conversational words off of, um, off of the Hebrew word. So um, anyway, yeah, probably more, more than you were uh, hoping for there, but yeah. Jonathan, I you back? I got frozen out, something had happened. So I am glad uh, uh, James got his, uh, I think James had that question about that. Um, did you get to Ronald's question? I only got to the Hebrew question. Let me see here. Uh, uh, yeah, what uh, what book or books would you recommend for preparation for biblical Hebrew? Wow, uh, that's a great question. Well, so we use we use something uh, uh, the the grammar that we have used at Gordon Conwell for quite some time is Basics of Biblical Hebrew by Miles Van Pelt and Gary Pratigo. Uh, Gary Pratigo was a uh, was a, a professor at Gordon Conwell, and uh, he actually wrote his his grammar uh, during his time at Gordon Conwell, and it's been used at Gordon Conwell for quite a long time. Um, I would actually encourage you uh, to just go ahead and purchase the the third edition of that, and if you wanted to prepare, you could just start working your way through the early chapters of that grammar. And what it would do is it would introduce you to the alphabet system, the, the consonants. It would introduce you to the vowels. Um, and uh, it would introduce you to, uh, by chapter three, to what we would call syllabification, how to pronounce 
the words. And what's really quite amazing about this is by the time you're done with chapter three, there's really nothing stopping you from at that point going through uh, the rest of the Hebrew, the, the rest of the grammar. And you could start memorizing vocab for, for all the chapters. Uh, I, I actually had a friend uh, that used to, you know, teach in a variety of, you know, language uh, type, type classes. And he was asked to, to teach Aramaic and uh, he needed to really freshen up on his Aramaic before he taught. And, um, and he said the first thing he would do is, you know, is, is try, as soon as he was able to start learning the vocab for the entire book and, and just how much easier it would go, uh, you know, just knowing the vocab of the entire book. Now, obviously, I'm not telling you you need to do that, you know, in pre we assume that every student that comes into biblical Hebrew at Gordon Conwell uh, or Greek, you know, we assume that they're starting, you know, fresh and that, you know, I assume that students don't even know the alphabet when they come into my class week one. Um, but it would, it would help you uh, significantly to even just work your way through the first three chapters of uh, Van Pelt and Pratico. And I can attest to that because I am a student in Dr. Young's Hebrew class. And um, what's really what's really amazing is that in about three weeks, you go from looking at squiggly lines to being able to actually pull together words. Um, and you know, it's just it's it's one of those senses of accomplishment to saying, you know wow, I'm like reading what a scribe wrote thousands of years ago, right? I mean, it's just, it's just amazing to be, able to, uh, to be able to do that. So we've got a couple more minutes left with Dr. Young. If you, want, if you have any questions about his specialty, uh, things in Old Testament, or, any, or even any questions uh, about Gordon Conwell, uh, as far as class modality, um, uh, maybe even about history, um, anything that can kind of help you on your journey. That's what these times are for, because we want to make sure uh, that if Gordon Conwell is a place that you're looking to either begin or continue your education, that you have the information you need. Moses, you got a question? Okay, thank you so much, Jonathan. I appreciate Doctor for those teachings and um, the facilitation you just took us through. It's such amazing and I learned so much. Uh, once more, and Moses Jawara from Sierra Leone, I did um, an application to Conway College, hoping to be accepted. But then, studying from this distance online, how better will we be able to have adequate materials in order to be well informed with regard to these biblical languages? Thank you. Um, so, could you, John? Could you repeat the question? I my internet was uh, was cutting out there for a second, so I missed probably the good portion of the last the last part of it. Yeah, I think Moses was uh, really trying to understand uh, the efficacy of the online learning. Um, yeah. You know, will he be able to get the same type of learning online distance uh, than if he was yeah. sitting in a classroom? Is that kind of what I got, got from you, Moses? Yes, exactly. Yeah, that, that's a fantastic question. Um, well, so I've, I have actually only ever taught biblical Hebrew in what we call a digital live format at Gordon-Conwell. Uh, a digital live format is something that's relatively new. It's been around maybe, uh, we've been doing it for five or six years, something like that at Gordon-Conwell. Maybe not quite that long. Um, but, uh, but anyway, 
we've we've been doing it um, and it's been incredibly helpful because what we're able to do now in for in Jacksonville, for example, is we've we've been able to offer language classes uh, in a weekly format as opposed to a three weekend format. Um, and so a three weekend format was, you know, you have to fly the professor in on three different weekends. And I, I took Greek this way and uh, it was it was incredibly painful. <laughs> and um, and it was just you had to have an awful lot of uh, of self-discipline to be able to to get through that. Um, I, I, I can tell you that um, students in, in, in my biblical Hebrew classes, uh, you know, I, I, I can't say too much here because of like FERPA violations and stuff, but um, I, there is no discernible difference on my end in terms of students' grades on whether or not they are attending all classes online uh, or uh, if they're in person all the time. I, I could not discern some kind of trend one way or another as far as that goes. And so uh, I, I, I really think um, for a lot of people, and, I, and I'll tell you, there's a lot of people that actually prefer it. They actually prefer it to being there in person because uh, what we do is uh, we do a lot of screen shares. Like I, I, when I teach biblical Hebrew, I, I got rid of a whiteboard entirely because it's very difficult to film a whiteboard. Uh, so what I do is I do a screen share and I, on my iPad, I can write uh, over my slides on the screen, and that basically functions as, as a whiteboard. And for many students, they sitting at home in their computer, uh, they actually, some of them prefer this because they're actually, uh, it's happening right there on their screen, and they're kind of more dialed in, you know, to their screen than perhaps they would be even sitting at class looking at the projector. So in some cases, it actually enhances things. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I saw a question here about the Garden of Eden being a, a mountain. Uh, and yeah, that's a quite a fascinating, um, fascinating idea. And I, I would actually, I would say it has enhanced, well, I'll read the question. Um, I remember being interested in Eden as a mountain, mountain temple. Has your PhD reinforced that? Uh, I would say I would say yes. My my time studying, um, you know, temple ideology in the ancient Near East, and um, and really seeing this temple theme that comes up again and again in scriptures, uh, I, I would say it has reinforced that. Um, to be quite honest with you, I went into it rather s skeptical. Uh, I remember um, thinking at times, you know. Um, you know, this idea of this, this mountain temple being such a prominent theme that seems to keep coming up again and again in scriptures. Is this something that's really there? Or are we just kind of, you know, uh, manufacturing this or making it out to be something that it's not? Um, and I, I can tell you, my, my studies have, you know, very much pointed me in, in the direction of seeing the, the prevalence of this and so if you think of, you know, the Garden of Eden and not, not to get going too long on this, but, um, you know, the, the main article that sticks out to me that was written uh, a number of years ago, perhaps back in the, in the 70s, was an article by Gort, Gordon Wenham called uh, Sanctuary Symbolism in the Garden of Eden. And there, there has, that has caught the eye of an awful lot of scholars over the years. You've seen that uh, article cited quite often. Uh, T. Desmond Alexander, who I, I did my, my PhD under, um, he builds on this uh, to some degree in his book From Paradise to the Promised Land and in his biblical theology uh, from Eden to the New Jerusalem. And, you know, it's quite interesting because, you know, Eden, the book, the, the Garden of Eden, there's nothing actually that explicitly tells you Eden at least in Genesis, right? There's the word mountain is not, is not actually there, but there's, there are things that we might say are there implicitly, right? And so um, one of them being is that there are four rivers that run from a particular location. And it's, you might, you know, you might say, well, well, how was that, you know? And uh, there are a number of other, um, you know, pieces of symbolism that connect the Garden of Eden 
uh, two other, you know, mountain sanctuaries in, in scripture. And so, you know, for, exa for example, the presence of cherubim that guard the way to the tree of life and the banishment of the, um, you know, Adam and Eve um, eastward. And you've, if you think about those parallels in association with later temples, uh, you know, the tabernacle and Solomon's temple, the, the fixed structure there when they, you know, in Jerusalem, uh, what do you have guarding the presence of God? Cherubim, uh, you know, that are on embro embroidered on the, on the curtains. And even the, the way that you uh, int were, if, if not that you would, unless you were the high priest on the day of atonement, but if you were to enter into the sanctuary, what, how would you do this? Uh, you would be entering from the east and going westward to the presence of God, because that's the way the temple was, was set up. And so there were a lot of books that were quite formative for me uh, uh, on this that kind of build on this, this idea. Uh, one of them being G.K. Beale's book, The Temple of God and the Church's Mission, is quite helpful. Um, another one would be L. Michael Morales' book, uh, Who Shall Ascend the, the Mountain of the Lord? Uh, it's a biblical theology um, of the book of Leviticus. Uh, I actually assigned that book for um, my theology of the Pentecost to course at Gordon Conwell, uh, as well as from Paradise to the Promised Land uh, from Alexander, which I mentioned earlier. And so anyway, all that to say, I think that all of this, you know, it, it comes up in other places in scripture that, um, you know, that you may not even expect, like even by the time you get to Isaiah, right? Isaiah chapter two, you get a mountain temple there. The, you know, Isaiah sees the vision of this mountain of the house of the Lord that will be raised above all the mountains. And you have people flowing to it, right? And you also have Torah instruction going forth from the mountain, a picture that's quite reminiscent of Sinai, right? And you have uh, the settling of disputes that takes place that and universal peace ensues as a result of this, this mountain temple that takes place. Again, uh, you know, a, a picture that's quite reminiscent of what we get in Mount Sinai in the Book of the Covenant, for example, um, with the, what we call the Mishpatim, the judgments, which form a kind of basis for, for doing just that, settling disputes. And anyway, this is something that builds throughout the Book of Isaiah. Um, and by the time you get to the end of Isaiah, this mountain temple vision that began in Isaiah chapter 2 has become, it, you know, it started off as this like little snowball. And by the time you're at the end of the book of Isaiah, it's this gigantic uh, idea of this universal um, new creation idea. And uh, it's, quite, it's quite an incredible image. And anyway, all of this to say, um, you know, the book of Revelation when you see in the New Jerusalem uh, builds on the things that Isaiah and Ezekiel envisioned to a significant degree, right? He's taken to a very high mountain, it says, just sim very similar to the book of Ezekiel, when Ezekiel uh, sees the vision of a new temple. And you, you get these points all, uh, you know, in this kind of biblical theology of, of the temple, where you see these commonalities of this mountain temple idea that keeps coming up time and time again. And it's just very difficult to look at this and say, wow, this is, this is just really coincidental. Um, but rather, uh, it's very fitting because the, the commonality in all of these things, the thread that ties all of these things together is the presence of God. And, and so it's very fitting that wherever the presence of God dwells, uh, that uh, the surroundings of, of that take on the characteristics of his holiness. And so it's fitting that you have these types of um, connections uh, between Eden and, you know, his presence, you know, even when, even in just when you see it, you know, the burning bush, the connections there between the burning bush and what happens later on at Mount Sinai and his presence in the tabernacle. And as I mentioned in Isaiah and on and on, um, it's quite fitting because uh, these are all reflections of the presence of God. And what we find in God's temple presence is you have a very, you know, these, all of these elements of symbolism that are there, but what are they there to do? 
they're uh, there to evoke the presence of God, and that you are in the presence of a holy God. And uh, that's reflected in all kinds of ways in what we would call material gradation, for example. The closer you get to the presence of God in the tabernacle, uh, the, the more pricey and precious the items become. You have you know, gold, for example, that's associated with the holy of holies. And what is it that we see when we get to the new Jerusalem? The city, the whole city is gold. And the city is cube shaped, the, you know, just sim very similar to the Holy of Holies. And, you know, when we look at the New Jerusalem, you don't see this holy precinct within the city. John says, I looked and I saw no temple. Uh, but, but what happens? The whole city is gold. The whole city is holy to the Lord. And it's this beautiful picture that uh, just builds and builds and builds throughout scripture and finds its ultimate fulfillment uh, in Christ and in the new Jerusalem. And, um, anyway, I, I, <laughs> I, I, I'll stop myself there because I get, I just get so pumped up when I talk about the, these things, but, uh, um, but anyway, I've, I've gleaned an awful lot from, uh, from teachers, uh, in, you know, authors that have reflected on this idea of the, of the temple. And that's one of the reasons I love studying with, with Alexander so much, because he's, he's just done so much work in this area. Um, and, uh, and certainly all the other ones I, I've mentioned there uh, from their books. You guys thought I was kidding when I was talking about mountains. And, and <laughs> yeah. we, we went from Eden and then we ended up in Isaiah, to the book of Revelation. So I never so, know where it's going, Jonathan. It, you you got to end up somewhere. So <laughs> hey, <I'll, laughs> might as well end I'll up in the Jerusalem. As much as I can. <laughs> Listen, um, Lori has a question. Lori, are you local? Are you in Florida? Lori, I know no, you. I'm in Matt. Yes, I'm in one of your classes right now. Yeah, uh, I'm about 40 minutes from the Hamilton campus. Ah, okay. All right. Um, you're asking about dropping in one of his um, Hebrew classes. So if you're ever local, you could be in uh, one of our classes. I don't know how it would work for you uh, Zoom-wise in one of his classes. That I, I can, I can send you, yeah, I, I can send you the, the Zoom link. Uh, you're more than welcome to sit in on, on, a, on a Hebrew class. That, that'd be great. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, long ago, before I applied to Gordon Conwell, I was a, I was allowed to sit in on um, one of Dr. Palachek's classes, and it was just uh, it was the last class of the semester, and it really it just drew me in, and that was it, and it just confirmed it just confirmed the call to the seminary. I knew I got all pumped up, like you said, and I knew I was supposed to be there. Yeah, and I'd I'd say that for everyone, if I you're more than welcome to to sit in. I, you know, happy if you email me, be happy to send you the Zoom link. And uh, we do have a rule with audits that they're not uh, they're not supposed to ask questions, you know, because uh, it just takes away the time from uh, from the other Hebrew students. We have a pretty decent sized class. I think there's like 15 in there, um, so it's not too bad. But um, but yeah, lo love to have anyone come sit in. Uh, feel free to to do so. I'm gonna put your email in the chat. And if they want to, if you guys want to coordinate that with Dr. Young, um, you can email him directly. Um, like I said, we're, we're, we're doing this for, for you guys' benefit. We want to be able to answer any questions, bridge any gaps uh, that you may have in your journey, um, either to uh, Gordon Conwell for the first time. You could, certainly, we, we do have current students that are available that are with us today as well. Um, but we, I really hope that this time has been beneficial for you all. We enjoy doing it. Um, Dr. Young wouldn't tell you, but he has been so geeked the last couple of days. You know, he, he is chock full of information. So him having to, he has to exercise great restraint so he does not send us a deluge of information. So, uh, we're grateful for his time. And, and if you could, we are one minute over, but uh, Dr. Young would ask if you would close us out in prayer. Yeah. Our Father in heaven, thank you so much for each and every 
uh, person that was able to attend this tonight. Um, I, I pray God that as they uh, journey through uh, your word and commit themselves uh, to the process of engaging with your word, that they would uh, have that long vision in mind of uh, a tree that's planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. And I pray that you would give us patience and endurance to, uh, to, to make our way uh, toward uh, that fruit. And Lord, I do uh, lift up every person here that's considering a seminary, that you would clarify the call on their lives uh, as, they, as they journey through that, that you would give them clarity of mind, that you would make their path straight. Uh, and Lord, I do pray for those that, uh, that are on the call tonight that have graduated seminary and uh, are on to all kinds of things in ministry. I pray, God, that you would uh, encourage them tonight. May they feel your presence and your blessing. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Uh, like I said, if you have questions um, about taking being there with Dr. Young, give him an email and uh, he'll reach out to you. You guys have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.